Hey everyone, it's 6.13 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, January 27th, 2022 years from something. This is, I'm hoping this will be another relatively short video. Um, I do want to sort of air something out, vent a little bit, and uh, maybe offer, uh, not I don't know, maybe a challenge, maybe not. A challenge to everyone listening to this, uh, no matter, you know, in what capacity. So, <clears throat> as anyone who's watching this can see, there's a, a Wikipedia entry on debate on the screen. The reason the Wikipedia entry is up there, because, uh, yeah, the only thing I find Wikipedia useful for is illustrating the mainstream or conventional wisdom, if you want to call it that, or information on any given topic. That's it. But I, I actually, I did a search, and um, the search that I did was um, the advantage, I think I put in the advantage of um, formal debate or um, something like that. And um, the results I got back were pretty bad. <laughs> Um, and that alone is a problem. So I want to equate this a little bit to, a little bit, to sports. And why we participate in sports. Why young people participate in sports. Maybe why even, you know, old people do, though I don't... Other than like, um, you know self-serving because you want to have fun you simply want to have fun is about the only reason why i think adults should participate in sports and professional athletes i think is the most ridiculous wasteful thing okay so i participated in sports when i was young i think sports are very good for developing children for a lot of reasons and they can be very bad for developing children for a lot of reasons the good reasons is that it teaches it teaches kids a lot of things or it should be able to teach kids a lot of things about themselves about other people um that just trying to tell them these things might not teach them as well you would hope that one thing it'll teach them about is other people, period. When you have to function on a team, you, you have to consider other people, okay? A kid who, well, he's just, he's very good at uh, something either because he's um, obsessively practiced or played this thing or because his parents or his parent has uh, made them obsess over it and think about it and whatnot. Maybe if they excel, oftentimes what you'll see is them being uh, very much a ball hog. And of course, that's them showing that they're not thinking of others. Uh, you'll see other children who get out there and really don't pay attention to what they're doing at all. Uh, they're only out there to, uh, to themselves, uh, entertain themselves. And that's not thinking of others. So there's there's ways that I think a proficient coach, even from the youngest age up, is going to um, help to properly demonstrate to these kids how they and their actions affect the other person. The same thing works now. That's a microcosm. It works in a macrocosm in our neighborhoods, in our communities, right, in our countries, in the world. Everyone's actions affect everyone else. You see, the people running things, they understand that, but they're not honest. They, they like to play like they're honest, but of course they're not honest. Because they will use that precept that everybody affects everyone, everyone's action affects everyone, when they want everyone to um, 
when they want to force something like they've been trying to do for the last year or so on everyone, then they use that that very true maxim. Everyone's action has an effect on everyone else. It's why in the Bible, in the nation of Israel and, and or Judah, or when they were one as Israel, everyone's actions affected the other person. And if the people were righteous at the time, they would single that person out for correction, whatever that correction meant. And it wasn't always stoning them, you know, sometimes, a lot of times, actually, it wasn't, the you know, the death penalty was for really extreme things. A lot of times it could be just putting somebody away. You, you literally have to ostracize them. Or there may be a punishment of restitution, things like that. But a righteous, a righteous nation looks at someone who is being lawless and they immediately move to correct that person, that problem, that behavior. That's a good thing. Same thing should work with teams, team sports. Okay. Um, when somebody on the team is, is behaving in ways that is not good for the rest of the team, there should be a correction there. That's why it's it, the sports can be good, and they can be good for your physical uh, and health and your mental aptitude, your uh, coordination, reaction times. These things are good because they can be very helpful when it comes to simply young people um, taking care of themselves. There's a lot of reasons why it can be good. Now, I'm saying all of that about sports because there's always good reasons why we have, let's say, traditionally, when our society, let's say, was a bit better than it is now, have put value on certain things and what we would put value on and what we wouldn't. Um, I'm a more righteous society would not put enough value on sports that literally these degenerates can make millions of dollars a year doing it for a living. But they would put enough value on sports that they would understand those things as far as how important it is for developing uh, children and young people. They're very important for many reasons. And one of those reasons is also structure. Um, understanding that a game has rules and that a lot of things can actually be decided by games if they're played um, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere of accepted rules. Things can be concluded. Uh, even apart from winning and losing, a lot of things can be concluded about, let's say, a certain team, how they were coached, um, uh, as opposed to another team, how they were coached. All of a sudden, I decide to make a video, and, and everybody's texting me, and my son gets up, so it's, I swear I can't win. Anyways, using that as, as sort of an analogy, and the idea of what a, a, a more righteous society, what they would focus on as being more important, I think we can look around a bit and, um, and see the the degeneration of our society based on what we find is important and what we are willing to or what we encourage um, to be the norm and something that I'm finding with all of the um, with all of the new information that's coming out for well let's just say 10 years a lot of information has either come out in 10 years or a lot of people have become aware of information that was there that they weren't aware of in about the last 10 years. A lot of, um, you know, social media and the Internet has played a huge part in this, of course. Um, the thing is, with, with all of that, with, uh, with all of the people out there that are supposedly helping you, telling you things that are beneficial to you. There is a fraction of those people, if they even exist, and I don't think, um, I don't think I'm being unfair when I say if they even exist. 
maybe you guys can correct me. There's next to n none of these people out there that will take the, uh, the claims that they're making, the body of information that they uh, are purportedly helping us through, helping us to grow using. There's such a small fraction of these people that will take that information and put it on the line in a real structured game that's very important if you take if you t uh let's we'll do basketball my son's in basketball right now let's do basketball you take a team let's say of 10 and you take a very similar team of 10 two different teams give them two different coaches that have two very different methods and there are many very similar things about these two groups. They're not, the, they're not the same, but they're very similar in a lot of ways. Now, you can tell a whole lot about the efficacy of the methods and ideas that one coach has compared to the other simply by seeing how well one team plays as compared to the other. But the only way you're going to be able to really assess that is for one thing if there is um we already know there's a fairness basically between the two groups um but also that they are playing a real game in an environment that is strictly moderated by a referee and really unwavering rules this is so important in judging how effective the method of one coach was as compared to the method of another coach. Or let's say the environment that um, one team had to practice in as compared to the environment another team had to practice in. Or so on and so forth. You could keep um, comparing or weighing these, these different um, factors between these two teams. And so again, it not just it's not just the the winning or losing, which tells you a certain amount. It's also the way that they play, how well they did. There, there are many things that one can weigh and judge by watching these two teams play only in a rigidly structured um first off the the court that they're playing on to make sure it's always the same regulation this is why sports has sports leagues have certain regulations they have to use a certain regulation size ball they have to use a certain regulation uh, height of, of basket type of backboard rim and i am still staying with basketball okay just for now um they they're just required to to wear certain shoes that fall into certain specifics and um at a certain point, they are, um, and right now, when they're, when they're super young, they don't cite them for traveling and other things like that, just because they would never be playing if they did that. But as they get to a certain point, then all of those league specifics come into play, and a referee has to call that game based on rigorous, unwavering rules of the game. And anybody out there, who pays little to no attention to the real important things going on in the world would at least know that and they would they would at least be able to affirm how important that is that you're not going to be able to understand whether this coach his method was good or this coach his method was not good this one uses zone this one uses man on man this one uses zone in defense or offense this one doesn't this one switches it up you know you can see how good those methods are based on what you observe in a game that has a, a rigid structure as far as rules and is refereed appropriately. Almost anyone could agree on that. And if they didn't, I don't know what's wrong with them. I think it's basic. So applying that same thing to academics, to ideas, to the pursuit of truth. We should logically come to 
debate. What you see today, what I see today, is um, an absolutely unacceptable lack of quality, structured, moderated debate in many of these areas of pursuits of truth, fact, knowledge, understanding, we see a horrible lack of it. I made a, I made a video some time ago where I, it was a challenge to Christopher John Bierkness to debate certain things. And, and really what I wanted to debate essentially was his, his claims, his many, many, many claims, uh, that the Bible was a specifically Jewish book, where I said that is certainly not true, and he can't back that up if we have a, a good, organized, solid debate, which he never agreed to. And there were people that were going through the right channels to get a hold of him so he could be challenged with that. And he, he never would. What Here's what we see anymore. This is what's sad. This is what we see anymore. What we see is not organized, structured debate where you have a proposition. Somebody's arguing for the proposition. You have somebody arguing for the counter proposition. You agree on that beforehand. Uh, the debaters are able to uh, study the work of the other. If it's available, they are able to uh, formulate their topic. There is a structure given to them beforehand. How long they'll have for an introduction? Will they uh, be able to respond to the other one's introduction afterwards? Will there be Q&A between the two? Will, the, will there be from the audience or moderators, you, you will have a structure and you can work from this just like if it was sports. You will have a structure, you will have rules, you will be able to practice, you will be able to work up your strategy, and these strategies are based on knowledge. How we come about, first off, this is, and this is the other thing that's not even in circles of academics of the highest rank will say, the PhDs, the masters out there. They don't spend nearly enough time, if any at all, going into the etymology of their arguments. Now, somebody suggested on the uh, in the comment section, I believe, of the most recent presentation that I put out, bringing it all together, that I should debate Charles Giuliani. Now, I'm familiar with Charles Giuliani. Anybody who's not, I have his book. One of them, I think he's maybe written a few. It is the book essentially criticizing the Bible. And I don't have it in front of me, so I'm sorry, I can't give you the title. Let's just say Charles Giuliani. I know his work. I've read a good deal of that book. I understand his arguments and how he's formulating them and what are the basises of the things that he proposes in this book. I could debate him. If we had, for instance, if we had a good solid moderator with good solid rules, we knew the moderator was going to keep the rules rigidly and we were going to play in a game where everything, what I knew going into that, that it wasn't going to be a free for all, which is what most of what they call debate. It is not debate. If they call an argument debate, it's not debate. If a guy has somebody else on his channel and they go back and forth, even if they're polite and they don't talk over each other, that's not a debate. That's an argument. That's a conversation. That's something other than a debate. If two people go on somebody's channel and that person who purports to be the moderator does not have a structure laid out that he tells everyone, here's going to be the structure of the debate. Here is going to be the proposition. This person's going to argue for it. He's going to argue against it and so on and so forth. And then they implement these rigid rules that have been agreed upon beforehand for the debate. It's not a debate. And there is a sore lack of real, authentic, academic debate where there should be a ton of it between all of these people making claims.
Now, when I said I did answer that comment and I said I really don't have a desire particularly to uh, pursue a debate with Charles Giuliani, um, and that has nothing to do with Charles Giuliani. It has to do with the fact that I just am anticipating it being a total headache and the parties not because I'm not going to set this up. I'm not going to put all of the work into this just to have it turn out that whoever's moderating it is controlled opposition. Um, and it turns into a, a free for all, an argument. I'm not going to try to argue over anyone and I'm not going to let them argue over me. At that point, when it becomes that, it's no longer a debate. It's no longer productive. Nobody's learning anything anymore. It's pointless. It's useless. It's, you might as well be watching Jerry Springer. Except these, usually these two people are in different locations and they're doing it via you know, Skype, Zoom, whatever software. But if they had chairs, they'd be picking them up by then. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And everybody out there who claims to be uh, presenting truthful ideas, they should be participating in some sort of guild in which is open to all academics presenting such ideas. And anyone should be able to challenge someone else in a certain... Now, you can't have... Look, you're, you're going to get to points where there's going to be a ton of controlled opposition that are going to get into those guilds and they're going to work with each other behind the scenes. They're going to say, okay, whoever it is that's part of this whole thing, they've got the ideas that we find the most dangerous. So we are going to absolutely hammer them as far as challenging them and we're going to do everything we can to make the uh, the propositions that we are proposing as convoluted as possible we're going to waste their time as much as possible because if we do waste their time as much as possible because by that time they won't be able to ignore these people anymore. Right now, they're mostly able to ignore people who are bringing up things they really, really don't want to touch. They're able to do that. They've, that's been a tactic for a long time. But if you had that, if you had this atmosphere of anybody who's presenting these certain ideas can either be part of this, this guild just a, a really an online thing because all of this stuff can be done online. They're part of this guild. Anybody may challenge anybody based on a a, um, a certain um, proposition. And it, it does have to be okayed by both sides. If the other side doesn't like the proposition, they say, well, here's the problem with that proposition that you're offering. Um, there is this or that aspect which... Uh, I find to be uh, a straw man or, you know, there's an issue there. You can even have somebody moderating that. As I said, though, something like that is going to be absolutely filled up immediately with controlled opposition. You have to understand that. But what can you do? That's where we're at right now. It is. It's where we're at. And they will probably try to absolutely control that, distort it, and use it like they use every other possible thing, vehicle, uh, platform to their advantage because they don't believe in making truthful war in the sense of, you know, like info wars. War in the sense of information and truth. They don't believe in that. They don't believe in truth. Uh, they, in any way, shape, or form, whether it would be war of words or whether it would be war on a battlefield, because they send other people. They send proxy armies. These people are degenerates. The, the ones who run things and their agents that are out there, they're degenerate cowards. They're little faggots. That's what they are. That's the people who run the world and the people who work for them. They're cowardly little faggots.
and so that's why they're going to work in the ways that they are. But there are still those of us who do believe that if you're going to if you're going to assert something as a fact, an idea as a fact. Let's just take the the Great Reset as it's pushed by, let's say, Tartaria Mud Flood, popular Tartaria Mud Flood. Let's just take that for an example. They should be willing and able to defend that in a structured, moderated debate. And I'm here to tell you that that is what we are sorely lacking academically today. And it's what we're sorely lacking in this country and many other countries of the world. Have you seen any kind of um, objective where you had two parties you knew were objective parties debating the, uh, the efficacy of, uh, uh, well, not the efficacy, I'm sorry, debating the truthfulness of the theory of pathogenic viruses. There has been no open public debate. We're the government, we say it's true, and of course we're backed up by popular science, who says it's true, who is backed up by the media machine, who says it's true. And we're backed up by unlimited amounts of money coming from pharmaceutical, the Federal Reserve, because the same people are running all of this. We will have no debate. I mean, honestly, you see these bags of crap like Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and Bill Nye, just in the, uh, the, the realm of science, and you will see it in other areas too. You will see them when it comes to the horrors that they push that they'll tell you, well, if there's, there's no good in debating a denier, somebody who denies the Holocaust, or somebody who denies that the Earth is a spinning globe, or someone who denies millions of years of evolution, or someone who denies uh, pathogenic viruses. Do you understand? They shut down debate before it happens. Now, if those people out there who are purporting to be telling you the truth, they're different than those people. If they will not participate in moderated, structured debate, they are as big a... They're worse. They're worse than the, uh, the cowardly scumbag liars at the top. Because they are cowardly scumbag liars purporting to be... Uh, poor, struggling, but sincere, devoted truth-tellers. Well, you should put your money where your mouth is. And I'm not saying that lightly because I am willing to do the same. I am not willing to do the same with a hundred controlled opposition people that come out of everywhere trying to challenge me because I only have so much time, but I will certainly answer to the call of a good, truthful proposition, which is not a straw man, which needs to be debated. Now, how many others are willing to do the same? And if the people that you're listening to or watching are not willing to do that, you need to call them out on it. You need to call them out on it in their comment sections. If they have Facebook groups or anything else, you need to do nothing but call them out on it, because that Organized, structured, moderated debate, formal debate is the way that they are going to show everyone whether or not there's any real teeth and substance to their argument. And with that, I'm a minute shy of 30 minutes, so I'm going to wrap it up. I hope you all have a good day. Thank you.